Hello and welcome back to another webinar with Boren Bond and Agritecture Consulting. My name is Henry Gordon Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of Agritecture. We're a global urban agriculture consulting firm, and we're honored today to have you joining us for our second webinar with in collaboration with Boren Bond. And so in today's webinar, we're going to do a deeper dive into urban agriculture in Belgium, and we're going to actually hear from my colleague Jeffrey Landau and also hear from Nelle herself and also all of you. At the end of this conversation today, we're gonna to be opening it up to questions and also ideas and thoughts you have. So hopefully we're gonna have enough time for that throughout this process. Um, but first of all, let me just allow Jeffrey to introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, this is Jeffrey Landau. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Agritecture. I'm excited to share some case studies of urban farms in Belgium. Henry and I were lucky enough to travel throughout Belgium last June and see some amazing operations and meet some amazing people doing some amazing things. So looking forward to sharing our thoughts on the trends and what these companies are doing and happy to answer any questions towards the end. Well, speaking of amazing, since you mentioned it so many times, Jeffrey, we have Nele here um, on the line. Nele, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Nele Lowers. I work for uh, Bourbons, uh, more specifically for uh, farmers looking for new business models like uh, urban farming. Um, anyway, in Flanders, um, I th uh, we think that urban farming is uh, more than just farming into the city, it's also uh, farming uh, around the city because it's a quite urbanized uh, central uh, location in Western Europe. So it's about food production in and around cities and then central to this uh, are actually the farmers who play a significant role in feeding the city and connecting the food uh, production again uh, with the consumer. But anyway, um, at the end, uh, after pr the production and uh, maybe also delivering other services, it's important to uh, run a business and that's where we are here uh, for. We have a very diverse group of around 50 people with very diverse business models and uh, development stages, but I think that uh, actually reflects what is uh, urban far farming for the moment. So um, thank you uh, to participate and uh, let's run a, a great evening. Thank you so much, Nele. So um, while Jeffrey and I and the whole agriculture team knows uh, urban agriculture quite well, our, our, um, our ability to speak the local language is pretty rough. So if we make some mistakes in pronunciation, please forgive us in advance. So before we begin, let's talk about some rules. First of all, um, I'd like you all to know that this is being recorded so that those that miss it get to watch it and also so that you can watch it afterwards. So you'll be able to get these slides in the form of the recording afterwards. Um, another point is that, you know, you can ask questions. Uh, you can ask those questions at the end of the webinar. We'll have time for that. The way to do that is to essentially use the raise your hand function on Zoom. If you don't know how to do that, you can feel free to chat. And my colleague, Bea, who's here helping us, will answer your questions in the chat. If a question comes to your mind and you really need to get it out earlier, you can feel free to just put that in the chat in advance and we'll do our best to get to it at the end. Um, so if you somehow don't feel comfortable with being on the recording, then feel free just to chat and I'll answer your questions. Um, you don't have to turn on your, your audio or video, but if you do wish to participate and share some knowledge and ask questions and be on the recording, you're welcome to do that at the end. So let's get started. So first of all, we're gonna really talk about, you know, why urban agriculture and vertical farming in Belgium and some of the drivers and some of the challenge that might make it a reality there. And I'll put the disclaimer here again that Agritecture is a New York City based urban agriculture consulting firm. We've worked in 26 countries to date and we had the honor of going to Belgium to learn a little bit more about your culture, your country and the farming methods happening there. But again, a lot of this is our perspective on it. So you may have critiques or, or contributions, totally welcome, but hopefully uh, you learn some things today. So first off, let's begin with the why. Um, I think one of the main reasons is that, you know, there's an importance in actually consuming food in the city. And so this is a significant part of the household income. We know from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that 80% of our global food supply is consumed in cities. And so it's important that we produce more of that food closer. Now, as Nelly mentioned in the Belgian context, there's actually already quite a bit of agriculture happening near the cities as the city and the rural areas seem to kind of combine across your beautiful but relatively small country. 
So another reason is that the demand for healthy food is very significant in Belgium. So we've seen that there's been a huge growth in organic food consumption and demand in Belgium. We actually find when we look at US data, the relationship between organic food and local food um, starts to be similar and local food starts to increase in demand. So I think that there's an interesting relationship there and a sign that organic food demand may also mean a driver towards urban agriculture in some ways. So there could be some opportunities there. Belgians also tend to spend less money on meat relative to other countries and more money on fruits and vegetables, which means that you, you value healthy eating, which is again an opportunity for urban farms that typically produce uh, fruits and vegetables specifically. And then greening the city, and I'm gonna talk about this a couple of times, but greening the city and circular economy initiatives are especially pronounced in Belgium. So that's an opportunity for farms that can provide an aesthetic impact, um, experiences in the city, and other drivers that make urban agriculture profitable. Many urban farms generate revenue off weddings and events and classes. So if there's an interest in greening the city that not only drives incentives for the capital costs of the farm, but also some of the ongoing revenue that can come from those additional experiences. There's also an opportunity to kind of connect the areas around the city, what we call peri-urban areas, and, the, and the, the consumption in the city. So there's a lot of farms in the outskirts of the city that may actually export that food or send it to a distribution hub that doesn't go to the city as fast as possible. And so there's interesting opportunities to not only connect that. And from a definition perspective, urban agriculture isn't actually just about production. It's about all the various aspects of growing food in and very near the city. And so that includes things like food hubs, specialty markets. And certainly in Brussels, there's some examples of specialty markets that are focused on just Belgian food and maybe even highlight Brussels grown food. So there's some opportunities there to start connecting those to the farmers in the peri-urban areas as well. Um, there's also the good food label and this overall good food project that's happening in Belgium, which basically is increasing awareness. So when governments get involved in promoting local food, promoting quality food, we see that there's an uptick in the interest of young people and entrepreneurs and investors to get involved in that space. Basically, as you drive demand from the consumers, there's now a reason to supply that food. And so that seems to be increasing awareness, food literacy and education, which again increases that demand. So that's an opportunity that we wanna watch if we're gonna consider growing food in near the city, or maybe something you wanna include if you're pitching to investors. Sustainable food system initiatives are trying to ensure a certain number of jobs in Brussels specifically, and there's specific targets for economic development as it relates to urban agriculture and job creation. So that's an opportunity as well. What's really interesting is that when we think about urban agriculture, there's actually interesting data that suggests that it could be more productive per square foot. And that's not only for CEA, which is defined as controlled environment agriculture, systems that are contained within greenhouses or indoor farms. Not only those systems can be more productive, but smaller scale urban farms can actually be more productive per square foot. One way to think about this is if you have a mansion and you're using that mansion, you're probably gonna use space less efficiently than if you live in a small apartment. Uh, when, uh, when farmers have smaller spaces, they tend to get very creative about the use of that. In the context of CEA, it's really more driven by year-round production and control through climate control, lighting, et cetera. So anyway, there's opportunities to increase the production per square foot or per square meter um, with less space, which is an opportunity for urban agriculture as well. Here are some general drivers that agriculture looks at. So when we look around the world, we talked about some of the first webinar, we think about drivers that would justify uh, vertical farming, which is uh, defined here as VF, UA represents urban agriculture. But vertical farming, which is a very expensive type of urban agriculture, certain things need to happen to justify it. So one of those things is water scarcity. And actually, um, you know, Belgium has some issues around uh, water scarcity as well. It's actually not ranked that well with its water security. So there could be some opportunities, especially in the future as climate change gets worse, uh, for increased incentives, increased opportunities around growing with less water. There may even be consumer awareness around this topic that residents are gonna to start to think, okay, I wanna actually source my product from farmers that are being more efficient with their water since we need to protect this. Uh, Belgium is a relatively small country, so it's arable land is quite limited. This could be a driver for especially vertical farming and controlled environment systems. And rising temperatures, as I mentioned before, there's certain urban heat island effect issues that are gonna get worse because of climate change. Certainly the EU is investigating this actively and trying to think about how urban agriculture could play a role in this. And there's also longer heat spells and dryness that are occurring, again, driving that water scarcity a little bit worse. 
So we need to think about how we can adapt to climate change and urban agriculture is one of those solutions. And vertical farming, just as a kind of reminder, you basically exclude all the environmental factors. So no matter what the weather is outside, you can control it indoors. You have to pay for that control, but that's why it's seen as a response to climate change by investors or policymakers. Greenhouses do that as well, but if you have a shady day or if you have a very, very hot weather, that's gonna affect your energy management in that greenhouse more dramatically than in a vertical farm. Other ones, again, I mentioned is the demand for local. We're seeing not only organic demand increase, but we're seeing that local demand is important. Now, in Belgium, it's a little more complicated in the EU relative to the US or other parts of the world. Uh, there actually are, are significant subsidies for local food. So it does make local production and urban agriculture less competitive than a farm, let's say, near, near Brussels. So you kind of have to weigh that out. I don't think the demand for local gives you as dramatic a price increase in the EU as it would in other parts of the world. Innovation leadership. This is a really interesting driver. You may be looking at the news and say, why are people building vertical farms? Why are they spending this money? I think a lot of uh, people who see the future and, and are either responding to climate change or want to make their nation um, a leader is trying to invest in innovation. And agriculture technology is a very hot topic from an innovation perspective. And so here is an example of a couple different initiatives that are trying to encourage this. I think the good food strategy is definitely one to look at in a lot of detail, but also uh, initiatives around circular economy. So what we see in Belgium that's different from say, innovative leadership in the UAE, uh, the UAE is very focused on food security numbers, or they're very focused on investment numbers and very focused on um, year round production in the face of their, their difficult climate. I think in Belgium with the EU there, they're definitely more focused on circular economy and deep green sustainability. And that's really exciting. And Jeffrey's gonna get into some case studies later on that signal how the farms in Belgium represent engagement with the circular economy, which is quite unique relative to other countries in the world where vertical farms are kind of just, you know, not connected to circular economy at all, for example. But there are some challenges. Uh, one of the challenges are that organic food is still quite expensive. So when we're talking about urban agriculture, we may market it as a food security challenge, but in the end it is for a premium customer in most cases. So that divide between organic food or local food um, and conventional products is quite large. So are we really feeding those people that need it the most in Belgium, or are we just providing more options for premium customers? That's an ongoing critique of especially high-tech urban agriculture, vertical farming and greenhouses in cities. And most urban farms need to start with a premium customer at the beginning. So that hasn't been solved yet. Uh, another big challenge in, in, in Belgium and the European Union is that hydroponics cannot, be certified hydro, uh, hydroponics cannot be certified as organic. And so where you get certain advantages, again, in the Middle East, and the debate is going on in the United States, you get certain advantages by kind of on, being onboarded with this certification that consumers are aware of, right? They recognize organic now that's been going on for several decades. You have to kind of come up with your own marketing to justify the additional cost or to even compete with organic on the market. And so the EU has made it quite clear that they're not gonna certify hydroponic farms as organic. So that's interesting to observe and that's gonna be a challenge to overcome if you're building an urban farm. And also there's a number of imports. Now this is a bit of a complicated one because Belgium is kind of a, a destination where products come in as a small country and because the next country may be only 50 or 100 kilometers away, it basically goes to another country. So it's a little bit complicated when we just look at imports as a raw number, but in principle, um, it's, we can investigate that and say how much food is being imported versus exported. And that food that's coming, for example, from the Netherlands can often be quite inexpensive. So again, you're not only competing against local organic farmers, which, which are, are again have the certification, but you're also competing against rural farmers that maybe have a lower cost of production and are subsidized because they're relatively local and you're competing against inexpensive products from the Netherlands and Spain. So there's certain challenges certainly that exist with any urban farm, but in Belgium, these are the significant ones that we've identified. Before we go into the case studies coming up, I wanna make sure we highlight again our trip to uh, Belgium. We went to Ghent and Brussels. We visited over I think 21 different urban farms. Jeffrey's gonna show you some of those. We actually did an interview with three different groups, Anele included, um, and various other players in urban agriculture, and some of the case studies we mentioned are interviewed in that podcast. So if you wanna check it out, we actually just put them onto YouTube now. So it's uh, agriculture or youtube.com slash agriculture, and you can watch them there, or you can find them on iTunes. 
So I think you'll enjoy that to hear from themselves uh, what, they're, what they experienced. And here are some pictures from our adventure. This one's in Ghent. This is Urban Crops. This is Tomato Masters. And I think again, this one was, hmm, I'll have to remember. Jeffrey will remind me in a moment. So let's move on. My colleague Jeffrey, I just need to unmute you. My colleague Jeffrey is going to be leading us through some case studies coming up here. Hey everyone. All right. So we're going to dive into some case studies. These are farms that Henry and myself visited while we were out touring Belgium last June. So let's dive right in. So up first we have Pacha Greens. This is a microgreens producer outside of Ghent. They are growing microgreens, a variety of microgreens, both in greenhouse and vertical farming systems. So that first image on the left, you can see that greenhouse system um, with several raised beds where they have their trays of microgreens growing throughout. On the top right, you can see Henry and myself with the wheatgrass in the greenhouse system and then the bottom right is in their vertical farming system. So they have a controlled environment with lighting schedules and different nutrient regimens that they are using to grow and germinate their microgreens. Um, so what model that Potter Greens is using is a direct to retail and consumer model. So they have their product available in retail stores as well as direct to consumers through a variety of different channels. Um, Super great way to engage your consumers to really showcase your brand and develop a brand to really differentiate yourself from the competition. A few um, tidbits about microgreens. So they're a sh short growth cycle crop, meaning that you can grow microgreens in about seven to 14 days, depending on the microgreen that you're looking to grow. These are a high margin crop, so it's very inexpensive to grow them and you can get a high, you can sell them for a high price, giving you a good margin based on that specific crop. But the issue is that it can be a volatile market. So microgreens aren't as commonly consumed as most people think. Um, you can see them as a garnish in restaurants. You might be able to buy a, a micro salad or a mini salad directly, or you can add it to your sandwiches or salads. But you know, this is a, a crop that does need some consumer awareness and some consumer education. And just to highlight a few of the varieties that they're growing, um, they have sunflower microgreens, they have a radish microgreen, which is a very spicy, um, mild flavor crop. They have another one called, um, let's see, pea germ, which is really interesting, and then wheatgrass, which you know is commonly seen in different juice shops as a, as a juice shot, or you can buy yourself and harvest it and eat, consume yourself. Um, moving on to the next. Can I add one thought to this one, Jeffrey? Yeah. One of the things I found really interesting about this project was that it was kind of an adaptive reuse of existing greenhouses. So these were existing greenhouses that had been left behind and then they were converted again when Pacha Greens found them and said, here's an opportunity for us to get greenhouses at a lower cost. And they also converted some of the interior systems as mentioned here into some indoor farming. So that's really interesting mm -hmm. as well because the agricultural system will fluctuate. Maybe floriculture is suffering, maybe one crop is suffering. And urban farms, especially those that require less space or maybe responding to a new trend, can, can reuse these in an adaptive way. And so that's also an interesting part of kind of sustainability, circular economy, and entrepreneurship that I, I found interesting with this one. All right, moving on. So here we have Le Champagne de Brussels. These are an indoor hydroponic mushroom producer. They are located in the cellars of Cure him, and apologies if I am botching the pronunciation of these words. Um, unfortunately, I only speak English, no, no French or other languages. Um, but what we have here is a really cool, innovative mushroom company that is using um, barley from breweries as a medium for their grow bags. So, you know, highlighting the circular economy, what's really important to note here is that this company is now taking you know, waste the waste stream from another producer and utilizing that in their own production method. So they have about a thousand square meters of active production um, in these cellars and they're growing a, a really cool variety of mushrooms such as shiitake, uh, nam nameko, and maitake. They are also growing microgreens themselves, but their core focus is really on mushrooms, growing up to about three tons of mushrooms per month. And it's just really cool to see a firm like this, you know, using barley, this waste that would have either been thrown away or, you know, 
pushed aside from you know one company and being reused as part of this you know circular initiative to mitigate waste and to really you know reduce reuse and recycle you know the inputs that you have in one company to make it an output in another company I also really liked how this one used different chambers within the cellar to grow different varieties of mushrooms. And so some of the differences in thinking between a traditional farmer and an urban farmer is the urban farmer is really going to try and maximize their space in interesting ways and create as wide a variety as possible if they're smaller scale to kind of excite consumers, excite restaurants and, and grow something new. And so they, they tend to kind of design little chambers sometimes, whether it's vertical farms or in the case of these mushrooms. So I thought that was interesting as well. Each one you went into had something different. Lost, there you go. Awesome. So here we have Urban Harvest. Um, this is a newly founded startup vertical farm in Brussels. They are using a variety of technologies such as uh, nutrient film technique technologies to really create the stack cultivation within a, a warehouse space by the abattoir. Um, what's really cool about you know, this type of technology and this type of farm is that it is highly water efficient. So they are collecting as much rainwater in their system as they can and recycling that water throughout the system to really be as efficient as possible when they're, where they're growing their crops. They're also capturing CO2 from the surrounding environment, not through combustion systems to help provide that CO2 to plants, plant production. And they're using highly efficient LEDs to grow within this closed environment. And they, when we met them, were looking at a direct retail model. Um, when we went to visit this facility, they were just about to build their next um, system. Um, and these are photos that were taken afterwards that we were able to find on on their web accounts. So it's really cool to see that they're growing a variety of basil and herbs and really vertical farms allow you to maximize your, your foot production space in a small level. So really using that vertical uh, incline, that alignment to go you know one, two, three, four stories up can really help increase the amount of yields per your, your square meter space. Um, so you can supply more crop to your customers um, almost year round. So um, I think that this project is really great and also covered on our locally grown in episodes. So they're interviewed, so you should definitely hear from them. But a couple of things to add is that, you know, one of them is a lawyer and I think the other one is an engineer. And so they could have done anything and they decided to develop a vertical farm. And I also really love the rainwater piece and the CO2 capture piece that Jeffrey mentioned. And I don't, I want to um, emphasize how unique that is. Uh, really in the United States, I can't think of any vertical farm that captures rainwater, for example. They would, you know, it's very rare that they would even spend the extra time to think about that and ask that question, um, nevertheless, even spend that money on it. And so that just, I think, shows you some of the attitudes in Europe and how they're different from the United States. And I think it also shows how the kind of initiatives around circular economy are actually making an impact for the entrepreneurs to change the way that they design their systems. They also did a really amazing job of saying, we don't need to kind of buy typical equipment but because they had experience kind of building things, they built some of their own you know, systems to manage water, to clean water, to pump water through the system. So urban farms are not only just kind of being very creative with space, but they're actually inventing new approaches because of the challenge they face and because of how they need to reduce costs. So really interesting case study there. And then these are some other farms that uh, we were able to explore and see. So, you know, we have Big, which is a rooftop greenhouse um, in the abattoir in Brussels. This is about 2,000 square meter high-tech greenhouse with also about 2,000 square meters of outdoor garden on the roof of the Food Met Market Hall. They are doing a variety of herbs and leafy greens and they also have an aquaculture facility where they're growing and harvesting fish. Um, on the far right photo, you can see a stack of honey. This is from you keepers. Um, they are based out in Brussels. We actually have Alexander on the call with us now. Um, this is a really cool apiary using, you know, these unutilized spaces to bring bees into the city to help with pollination, um, with different biological systems, but also producing local honey, you know, for the surrounding areas. Um, on the bottom left in the, the photo with the four individuals, myself, Henry, and our two urban farmers, we have Roof Food, which is a rooftop farm. 
And what's really cool about them is that they're using the rooftop of this building as a venue space for dinners and tours. So they're growing produce, herbs, leafy greens, fruits and vegetables um, throughout the season and then using that product for different venue and event spaces um, that helps really fund and run their business. Um, another super cool uh, restaurant hotel farm we saw, which is in the top left, is out to the Grut Ilan, which is using a really you know unconventional space behind a, a hotel and restaurant to really maximize you know green space as well as producing crops that can help support this restaurant, um, which was an, an awesome experience and really cool just to walk through and kind of you know place yourself within this this new green urban farm you know during you know the busy day of an urban city and then bottom left we have plant which is an indoor vertical farm they are using different container solutions to provide direct to restaurant um, model crops for their customers i'm having um, flashbacks of the the bee that stung me at you keepers <laughs> seeing this image because i got sworn by the bees during that tour but anyway and and you can see a few of those bees on the top right in those photos there. So those are on top of residential buildings within Brussels. Um, so it is really cool to see, you know, where you can place these types of um, agricultural systems and, you know, see what they can produce within, you know, an urban city. But, you know, next what we want to highlight um, is a really cool um, circular economy system and collaboration between two organizations that are producing very different crops but are working together in this symbiotic relationship. So we have here, which is Omega Bars. This is an aquaculture farm breeding an Australian freshwater fish called perch. Um, they are working collabor collaboratively with Tomato Masters, which is a hydroponic tomato greenhouse company, which you can kind of see in that bottom photo. You can see the greenhouses right there. So what Omega Bars is doing is you know, they have a shared reservoir with Tomato Masters. What happens is Tomato Masters will take that rainwater, will run it through their systems to feed their plants, will clean out that water, bring it back to the reservoir, and then Omega Bars will take that water and run it through their systems where the fish will um, live, breathe, and excrete excrement into that water solution that water solution will then have different nitrates and fertilizers that can be used to help feed the plants and they'll create this symbiotic relationship where they're reusing this water through a recirculation irrigation system to help feed the tomato plants and to help um, keep the fish living and breeding. So if we go to the next slide, we can see um, what Tomato Masters is doing. Um, they have a very massive 32 hectare facility um, you know, this is a family run business, I think six generations doing about four different varieties of tomatoes. Um, they also have two on site co generation plants that not only support the greenhouses, but also provide electricity to about 15,000 households in the area. And while they're doing this, they're also in this collaborative relationship with Omega Bars. And out of all my research and my travels, you know, within this industry, this is by far one of the coolest collaborative partnerships that I've come across. Really, you know, a, a greenhouse hydroponic operator working with an aquaculture facility um, in a symbiotic relationship that benefits not just uh, them, themselves, each other, their businesses, but also the environment and the surrounding community. Um, so, you know, really, really impressed by what they're doing here. Um, and really excited to see where these two companies grow as they continue building this relationship. And I hope, you know, this can be an example for future um, operators that are looking to establish type, a different type of urban farm, whether it's in a city or skirts in the other cities, um, bringing in different partners that can work in collaboration to really create this circular economy style relationship. Yeah, thank you for those case studies, Jeffrey. And I think it's really great that you included um, Tomato Masters and Omega Bars, even though they're not urban, as you said, they represent the circular economy and they represent it at scale. Um, so that's really what's interesting about that. Um, so much innovation that we were able to observe as part of that tour. So just briefly before we get into the question and answer period, so definitely prepare your questions or be prepared to raise your hand, we'll get into that. Um, Agritecture has a series of classes that we're offering at $50 off. To any participants in this webinar or the previous webinar, if you're a Bourbon Bond member, 
So just briefly talking about it, this is a class that kind of combines some of the strategic planning I mentioned here already, but actually goes into how you might choose between a greenhouse or a vertical farm or soil-based urban farm, and even talks about the kind of equipment you, you could choose. It also tells you how to build your economic model, how to do your marketing and sales, how you think about packaging, how you think about hiring your team, calculating labor. It goes quite into depth and it's all online right now. So this is an example of the classes that we cover in it. So the organic one obviously is less relevant because you, know, you can't be certified there, but does talk about aquaponics in it. And you may be interested in pursuing organic practices either way. So um, you know, it's open to anyone. You can sign up by going to design.agriculture.com. But if you're a Born Bon member, contact Nelle and you'll get $50 off. And so again, you can just go here and sign up. And there's even a free part to the product. You can just give a try if you go here. We entered some questions about you know, what kind of farm, what kind of budget, what kind of crops. And you get a little bit of uh, information on some typical farms similar to your idea. So it's a little bit of a free kind of vision report that you can get started with. So here's the timeline that we've been working on so far with Born Bon. So we had our first webinar, which was great. We had almost 100 people on that one. Uh, we opened it up for signups to the classes and those are still open as well. So um, you, can, you can feel free to join those. If you're a Born Bon member, just contact Nelly. Today we're having this webinar. And then again, as another benefit for Born Bon members, we're offering a discounted one hour consultation with our team. And it's not just Jeffrey and I, we have team members that have done over 80 economic models for urban farms, greenhouses and vertical farms. We have people with over 10 years of experience in cultivation. We have permaculture certified staff. We have CEA experts. So we have lots of expertise and you can book an hour with one of our consultants at a reduced rate. And if you're a startup, for example, if you have a company, you can have up to four people on that call as long as they have the same email as you. So it's a great opportunity uh, for you to do that and to get that knowledge, maybe bounce off some ideas or validate some goals that you have. And so we're opening that up all the way for the next month. That's something that you can reach out to Nelly about any time and she'll uh, connect you with us to make sure you get that deal. So now Nelly is gonna tell us a little bit about membership and then we're gonna get into some Q&A. I'm unmuting you now, one second. Just takes a minute. I think the problem is if you click it and then I click it. There you go. Okay. There I go. Okay, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Um, just a short, some words about Gurbons. Uh, so in, it's an organization of farmers and horticulturists in Belgium, mainly Flanders. Uh, we organize a lot of network events, workshops, uh, other informative uh, events towards farmers uh, and group uh, often, but also we give a lot of one-on-one -on -one advice on all kinds of legal issues, which is sometimes very complicated in agriculture. And uh, maybe a little bit uh, less well-known is that we also uh, give a lot of advice on all kind of new uh, innovative techniques or uh, business models, like uh, already for a long time, we consult on uh, short uh, chain um, selling, but uh, more re recently we are also uh, bringing information about carbon farming, uh, urban farming, and help farmers with the information they need, and often also help them with uh, a network of other farmings, farmers doing new uh, things or a network to, uh, towards governments. So in short, that's what we do. And then uh, at the right uh, part of the table, you see that we uh, yeah, that the cost of the membership is around uh, 200 euro for a full-time farmer, but in the first year you pay half the price. Um, so that's it. Well, there you go. Nelly, I wanna thank you so much for this. And we're gonna move into the question and answer period. So now it's your turn. Um, if you wanna put your questions in the chat, uh, I'll read them out. Or if you wanna ask the question yourself, just raise your hand and give me a moment to unmute you. And again, I just wanna give a big thank you to Boren Bond for partnering with us on this knowledge sharing and especially the amazing visit we had. I mean, we visit a lot of farms, a lot of places around the world, but uh, there was a really interesting context in Belgium to really see the circular economy in action and so much variety of crops and scales, really, really loved it. So we have a first question from Lode. Um, what's your view on the emerging in-home growing units? FarmShelf just launched an incredible unit for the home. That is a good question. Okay, so I guess I'll just first begin that um, I consider, you know, FarmShelf as part of the category of distributed, we consider it as part of distributed agriculture. So typically 
if you're looking at companies like Smallhold or Farm Shelf or even Infarm, they have a centralized hub and then they serve their products to smaller units. We call them micro farms within restaurants or within supermarkets. So they're not the only ones doing that model. They've had a lot of success in New York. I believe they had over 80 installations in New York from food halls to restaurants, et cetera. But they were always thinking about the home market. But I think after COVID-19, suddenly the restaurants don't exist. Suddenly no one's buying. And so that model suddenly has to adapt. And all of these companies have had to adapt in their own way. I think Infarm is, is mostly in supermarkets, so maybe not as much. But if you look at Smallhold, they started selling mushrooms that you could grow at home. They pivoted very quickly and they would sell little bags. If you look at Farm Shelf, they announced their home unit. My opinion is that they are beautiful. Um, I think that there's a lot of reasons to grow food at home. I think a hydroponic system makes sense if you're in a place that um, you, know, you don't have outdoor space or the weather is difficult. But I think the price point is extremely high for most families that are looking to engage in this. So unless you're really a premium target customer, that can afford a 5,000 euro, 4,000 euro unit, um, it's gonna be very difficult. And certainly the cost of, of leafy greens in Europe is even cheaper. So you can just calculate um, with that many plant sites, how many salads do you need to eat before you get your money back? So if it's not about saving money, then it's gotta be just about the experience. And if it's just about the experience, and that's a premium customer. So I certainly wish Farm Shelf all of the great, greatest success. But if we look at the history of AgriLution that was acquired by a a kitchen manufacturing company, if we look at the history of Grove, that had to sell its, its knowledge to LG and ended up being dissolved as a company. I've analyzed about 90 different home, home products for production over the past 10 years, and they tend to really struggle with either being a gimmick or being too expensive. So it's a really, really difficult market to break. Um, and certainly I think that there's better ways to do it if you wanna just grow yield. Um, just to plug something, Agritecture has a, a product called Plus Farm. It's a, a product we don't make any money off of, um, at least not you know, by selling it. And it's basically a DIY, no frills way of growing hydroponically at home. So I think the lowest cost version is somewhere around $500 and has 72 different plant sites on it. You can also look at versions for free. You can hack it, you can change it. So that's a kind of our response to the home growing market. I don't think it's great for restaurants where it needs to be more beautiful but there's something you can look at there. So thank you for that question. Any other questions or does anybody wanna share any knowledge or insights from their farming experiences? Okay. Um, to the speakers, do you see vertical farming also suitable for soil-free and climate-free production, staple food crops for consumption? For example, for wheat or grain or other cultivars, potatoes, basically anything besides herbs or leafy greens? Um, or what are the challenges and how they can be overcome? <laughs> it would be nice to eat vertically grown Belgian fries, says Lode. Well, I, I hear there's, we need all the reasons possible to eat Belgian fries right now, and I'm a fan, so send them to me. Um, it's a great question and one we get commonly. So let's begin with technically. So technically, you can grow anything in a vertical farm. And if you wanna look at that research, you can Google NASA research related to vertical farming. They tried to look at vertical farming for high density production, for space travel, and, and living on the moon and Mars. And technically, they're able to grow anything. Now for wheat and corn, they use dwarf varieties to reduce the height and to increase the density. But again, technically, they were able to grow it and they're able to, to, to produce some product and yield. Now, why is not economically feasible? There's a couple of reasons. I think there's, there's various drivers for what makes growing indoors and growing in vertical farms justifiable. I think the first one is freshness. Is it more valuable because it's fresh? And I think that if you look at potatoes, if you look at um, wheat, if you look at corn, um, especially wheat and potatoes, a lot of the, the, the yield from that goes into a processed product. So the consumer doesn't get the product fresh most of the time. So you know, I think in the US, most of the potatoes are turned into potato chips and fries. That's where most of the consumption goes. So although a fresh potato may grow great, the demand for fresh potatoes and that flavor isn't as high as the demand for the processed product. So there's, there's not really as much of a justification. Another reason is, it, does it ship well? So if you ship uh, leafy green, it really loses its quality over time and you have to spend a lot of energy to ship it. But if you look at wheat or corn or, um, or, or potatoes, they ship a little bit more easier, especially wheat and corn and staple crops. They ship more easily. Another reason is kind of edible biomass. This is the percent of the product that's edible. 
So one of the ways that you can look at this, it's also called harvest index. So lettuce plant, 90%, 95% of that product is, is, is edible. The biomass is edible. Um, in contrast, I think wheat is, is, is lower. And certainly if you look at like an avocado tree, an avocado is much lower. You have to produce all that biomass to get the fruit. So if I take an avocado tree, for example, or let me try to think of a stable plant. If, it's, if I take wheat and I put it indoors and I only have a small harvest index, that, that, that harvestable product, I have to spend all that extra energy, whether it's in a greenhouse creating climate control and some lighting, or whether it's in a vertical farm where I have to create all of that control. So I have to spend that extra money, but I'm only getting a smaller harvest index. So the economics make more sense when you have a lower, a high, the highest harvest index possible, when it's fresh, when it doesn't ship easily. And I think it also makes more sense when it harvests quickly. So if I have more turns in my system, so lettuce is every 30 days, that means that I'm gonna get more cash flow to recoup my high CapEx. So it's very difficult to make an investment of that scale if you're not creating cash flow early on, the risk is higher. So I think that's the case with indoor farming. So I think in the future, we'll see a little bit more variety. We're gonna see more tomatoes grown indoors. We're gonna see more varieties of tomatoes, maybe even some peppers. Um, we're gonna to start to see some different specialty herbs. Some people are experimenting with um, different crops like wasabi and saffron that are very expensive products. We're also gonna to start to see different berries like strawberries be popular. But I think beyond that, I don't think we're going to see much variety in the next five years. Vertical farming plays a certain role in the food system, but it does not replace the typical food system and the soil we need. Good question. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? I was thinking while uh, Niels is also here, maybe uh -huh. he can talk uh, or say Niels, something about I'm their... you. you've been You've been called on. Hello, Niels. Hello, hello. <laughs> How's it going? Well, fine. You? I'm great. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, I'm not that prepared. Uh, um... <laughs> well, start by introducing yourself. <laughs> well, I'm Niels from Plant. You mentioned mentioned us, uh, uh, but you didn't visit us. Um, well, uh, we um, we use a technology of uh, urban crop solutions, which you already already mentioned, and uh, we grow um, uh, we grow. Uh, uh, leafy greens and herbs uh, in Antwerp and we sell them directly to uh, the restaurants and then COVID-19 hit us and uh, now we sell a, 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 a plant box we call it uh, with a with a mixed salad uh, for uh, for the so particular the, how homes, do you say that does it go to the homes or does it go to supermarkets yeah no no we households directly yeah. to, household. to the doorstep so you, you you adapted to COVID 19 by saying we're going to go direct to consumer and you created a new product with the boxes right yeah great so yes. how's that going well uh it'll actually be launching uh later this week okay uh because uh we well the friends and family who are supporting us uh the past few weeks um uh well they were so uh enthusiastic uh, that uh we thought of uh going to market uh with it uh so we we will be delivering um we were looking for uh 50 clients household how do you say it, um uh, to be our uh pilot guest uh, test panel um okay. for the, uh, the the next few weeks um so we can uh we can um, well experience right. uh, what's what's everything. the price point of the box is there one size or are there multiple sizes there's one size it's 10 euros uh, 12 euros 12 euro and a half and 10 euros for the the um, the packaging but uh, it's a um, how do you call it in english reusable a it's a it's a yeah. refund it's a yeah. um Great, it's a deposit, is what they say. You put it's the also it's a uh, it's a uh, um, abonnement. How do you say abonnement in English? Um, a subscribing uh, type of a subscri subscription. Oh, a subscription. Yeah. subscription. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a weekly it's a weekly box. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, we wish you the best with that, and and to our Belgian friends on the call, make sure you um, give that a try. Sounds sounds if fresh. If you live in Antwerp. If you live in Antwerp, okay, Belgians in Antwerp, very specific. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. I'm going to answer this next question that's come up. And then, Alexander, if you want to talk about something, I, I do want to ask you a question, Alexander. You work with so many different kinds of urban farms, and you do so many different methods from, you know, bee production to bee to, to, to rooftops to real estate developments. 
So I'm going to ask you in a moment, but I want to ask you, what do you think is the most promising type of urban agriculture for Belgium in the future? So hang tight, but I'm going to answer this question first. So um, this question is, can you work together with the inhabitants of a city and basically make a family greenhouse, kind of a cooperative greenhouse? You plant and the families pick the vegetables. So this is actually a really good idea that has a lot of different potentials. So, you know, there's community gardens, there's even um, something called agri-burbs, like suburbia and agriculture that are getting popular in the US. And there's a range of ways to do it. Some of them are managed by the residents, so they get little lots. Um, and maybe there's a gardener that they can ask questions to. And some of them are managed by an external farmer and they're just like available. So they look nice and the, and the, and the members can buy the product on a subscription. And some of them are kind of managed by um, the, the, the residents harvest them like you described, but they're managed by someone else. You can kind of go and pick your own, but it's basically taken care of all the time. So there's different ways to do that. I think that, you know, it's a really good model, but there's a couple of things you need to achieve. One is you need to make sure that the price point of supporting it is enough. So either the residents have to be paying enough money to justify the, the, the capital cost, the return on investment, and the cost of the gardener. You need somebody who knows what they're doing or the farmer. Um, or if they're buying it from the farmer that's managing it, that needs to be make sure that that cost is reasonable for both parties. So that usually requires some kind of scale. If it's too small, it doesn't work. Um, if it's managed by the residents, it tends to be that some residents don't take care of it and some do. So then there starts to be complaining about the way it looks or oh, you left your, your, your shovel on my, on my lot. You know, you leave your buckets everywhere. People complain about things not being taken care of. So, you know, there's some issues there. But I think that the benefits of it, let's say you did a greenhouse, are that you really reduce distribution. So, you know, distribution is one of the greatest disruptions of urban agriculture. When you can get direct to consumer or you can go direct to restaurant or direct to your supermarket, you have a lot more control than the typical farming system. So, you know, if you're really di disrupting that significantly, if the farm is right on site, and if you can reduce the labor as well as distribution by having people harvest it, then you're actually improving those economics significantly as long as you have enough scale. So it's a really interesting way to do it. Um, we have a client in Saudi Arabia that's now investigating on how to do it um, for different households in Saudi Arabia. There's examples in Dubai of the sustainable city that's doing it. And there's numerous examples, even in New York with, um, it's called Irby, it's a development on Staten Island that has an urban farm on it. And then there's various ones across California and the United States that have agri burbs. So if you want to search for examples, I would search agri burbs and I would look at some of those, some of those examples mentioned. Um, seniors homes, I think, could really benefit from this as well, because you want seniors to stay active and you want the fresh product as well. So great question. Thank you for that. Alexander, can we maybe hear something from you briefly? Bonjour. Yes, hi. Bonjour. Ça va bien. Um, my name is Alexandre Lefebvre. I'm um, the founder of Alob and uh, uh, Ukeepers. I'm an urban beekeeper, but I'm also an expert in urban farming. I'll help uh, everybody that wants to put the agriculture in the city at different scales. Um, in Belgium, um, all the city, uh, all the farm is next to the city. We are, it's a very uh, special country, maybe more than 80% of the population uh, uh, live in the city. Also, um, it's a very, um, yeah. Um, what do you think the, the, do you, think the you know, you've been exploring these, what do you, what do you think are the winning, like what, do, what is the thing you're most excited about for urban agriculture in the future in Belgium? Because it is challenging because of the, the reasons you mentioned, but obviously you're doing it. Um, is it the real estate projects like the one you did in Circular City? Do you think that's the future of it, which is similar to the question that got asked? It's kind of a garden that's managed. Do you think it's more added value products, which, which have a higher value like the beer you produce or the honey you produce? What are you betting on? We, we have we have already a, um, a lot of different uh, farming projects in the cities in Brussels, but also in other uh, other region. Uh, but I think the future is to rebuild the food belt, you know, the belt around the city to produce more food, like um, tomatoes, uh, maybe fish with aquaponics, etc. 
but fresh fruits next to the city that's the future the future because um yeah that that's something where we can um grow very very much a lot of volume more than in the city in the city we 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 had a, a lot of project now and they will grow but not as much in the belt of the cities i think yeah I think that's a great point. And just a couple of things to highlight, you know, Priva is a big climate control system and their CEO is very passionate about green belts. And so she's launched a new sustainable urban Delta foundation that focuses on these green belts and how to protect them, encourage them, and even bring more agriculture into them because they're at threat across the globe even. Um, a lot of them are being developed into suburban areas. And so that's an interesting foundation to look at. But one of the ideas I was brainstorming recently was um, a response to what happens as we see urban agriculture mature. So as urban agriculture starts to proliferate through the city, the farms start to even compete over space or compete over restaurants. And so there's some challenges that happen there and they start to say, okay, well, we, we wanna raise more money. We wanna grow more food. We might wanna actually look next to the city. And, and if you look at Gotham Greens, for example, most of their projects are next to the city, not on rooftops in the city anymore. So that's one example. You also have talent that gets experience with the basics of agriculture and suddenly they wanna actually make a bigger impact. So Square Roots, which is a, a container company um, that has an accelerator kind of program for new vertical farmers, the farmers that graduate from that, actually some of them move to organic farms outside of the city and they wanna get apprenticeships and they actually buy land sometimes and do that. So I think that's really interesting that somebody with no farming experience learns farming through hydroponic vertical farming in the city and then ends up working on an organic farm. So I think with the policy structure in Belgium, which is certainly one of the strongest, there could be really interesting programs. This is kind of the idea I was thinking about where you're encouraged to scale up outside of the city afterwards, because then you get the best of both worlds. You're close to the consumer. You have your urban outpost. That's maybe your brand and is your showcase place and you can reach restaurants, but then you actually start to improve and protect the green belt outside of the city and reach scale. So I think that may be something to kind of work on is how do we identify the journey of these urban farmers and how can the government actually connect them to impacting food security uh, more positively? That could be really interesting. Um, thank you so much, Alexander. I uh, really appreciate your time. So Olivier, okay. there are lots of initiatives on urban agriculture in Brussels and surroundings. Is there somewhere a systematic overview of all those initiatives, large and small, are located? I guess a question for Nele. I mean, in Belgium, I'm certainly not aware. Um, I think that there's not a single database of initiatives, but certainly um, our blog features global projects around this topic. Um, we even have some about Belgium and France. Um, Alexander has wit written some on his blog, but that's really mm -hmm. the main way to get them. Databases are hard to come, from, um, you know, come through on this. If you use our software product, the free part of it, as I said, after you enter your information, you'll get three ideas similar to your idea. So that'd be maybe one way to find them. But certainly incentives and initiatives. Uh, Nelly, any questions on that? Well, I can just add, I have like a, yeah, a list for myself, of course, of all the initiatives I know. So uh, if you have questions on certain types, I, uh, I'm, um, I'm there to answer any questions. So uh, you can always ask uh, now or afterwards, um, and I can help you out with the companies I know. Me too, and uh, Nella, you can um, maybe talk about ABOP, the project of Federation, Association of... Um... Yeah, there's an initiative now in Brussels. Uh, exact, uh, actually, it's uh, Alexander who is uh, a bit managing it, uh, together also with some other persons like uh, Augustin from Sky Farms, also a very interesting uh, um, project. And uh, it's a bit comparable with the initiative in Paris, where they uh, bring together the farmers in Brussels um, to also um, yeah, uh, uh, raise a kind of a, an organization around the commercial urban farmers. And the same thing has been done now in Brussels. Um, so, uh, yeah. People are uh, organizing. Um, yeah. Also in Bourbonne, we have like a small networks uh, looking into the vertical farming um, uh, uh, issue. So also there, we try to bring 
businesses together at one side, but also uh, look for partners outside, uh, like research center, mm -hmm. uh, governments, and so on. Far Farm Tech Society is also an interesting group that's mm -hmm. more focused on policy, and they're based in, Br in Brussels. And then there's the University of Jean Blanc. Is that what it's called? No, Jean, not Jean Blanc. Uh, Jean, Jean Blanc. Blue. Jean Blue. And they do some interesting, <laughs> interesting research around urban agriculture that may be of value. So there's some resources for you to look at. Um, Nelly, you had a question uh, uh, from someone that wanted to translate. Do you want to maybe say it? Yeah, so I have a question uh, from Bart, who uh, runs a very uh, unique uh, tree nursery uh, uh, with uh, very rare uh, fruits, trees, mm. and uh, West Flanders. So uh, he's really an expert on everything about uh, soil and uh, soil life. So he asks, uh, is it, isn't it a bit daring to think we can manipulate uh, food protection out of soil? Um, because if you know uh, how complex uh, all the, the, the soil life is with all the natural minerals, uh, the soil uh, life, um, well, the living uh, yeah. in the soil, and then uh, the, the interaction with the sunlight, we try to uh, do the same. But actually, we can't, if you are honest. So can't we uh, look for models who are more uh, uh, going into farming together with nature instead of um, apart from nature? That's his question. Well, thank you. Your, your, your work sounds really fascinating. And I'm definitely going to look it up. Nelly was mentioning it before the webinar began. So you know, first of all, agriculture believes in a diverse food system with many different methods. We don't think that vertical farming is a solution. We don't think that greenhouse is a solution. We don't think that soil is always the solution either. Um, the world is vast, the consumer demands are, are vast, the sustainability challenges are complex. So what we really think about analyzing them each and identifying trade-offs for each project. So with that introduction, I'll also say that as someone who speaks a lot about hydroponics, I get a lot of people to come up to me and they say, but it's unnatural. How can you promote something unnatural? And what I like to say back to them is I'd like to say, could you please tell me when agriculture was ever natural? Unless we're going out and we're picking from random trees that exist in nature without controlling them, um, the minute we started organizing fields, the minute we started organizing irrigation, the minute we started breeding seeds, we used engineering to improve the natural processes that plants go through. So you can't really remove engineering from agriculture today. What you can ask is how much engineering is appropriate to solve the problem. And so I think that there's a lot of amazing things that happen in soil that we don't even fully understand yet. And I certainly wish that we could provide all the food for everyone consistently in soil, but there's certain circumstances where that doesn't work as well. And there's certain entrepreneurs that feel like they wanna go in a different direction or use certain technologies to engineer that. I don't think it's fair to criticize them for using engineering because that's been part of our process since agriculture was born. I also think that when we think about growing in soil, and certainly you can grow in soil indoors, and, and there are certain projects even in Belgium that are growing in soil indoors, um, then you can start to get some of that complexity, but also the control. But you know, I think that when you're growing outdoors, we often think, well, that's so beautiful and perfect. But we know that outdoors, there are certain things that the plants go through that may affect their ability to grow properly, whether that's climate, whether that's disease that happens in the soil, I mean, certainly in New York City, there is no soil that you can grow in. All the soil is contaminated. So if you want to grow in the city of New York City, your choice is to bring in external soil, which has its own sustainability questions, maintain that soil quality consistently, or you can choose to go hydroponic. And I think there's trade-offs across the board. So I, I admire your focus on the soil, and I think it's a great way to do it. But I think that there are certain circumstances where there are other choices that may be viewed as unnatural. But I think that it's, it's a little... Um, it's not correct to say that all engineered forms of agriculture are natural because it's part of agriculture overall. Um, so this question is, is the distance, this is probably our last one coming up. If you wanna ask one more, you can. Um, is the distance relevant in Belgium as it is so small or is it to make the most of empty spaces and rooftops in cities? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really the question. That's really the, 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 one of the big questions in Belgium because the farms are so close, how does it work? And, and I think, I think one thing is a little bit like um, we already talked about. It's about engaging in the circular economy. Urban agriculture is particularly exciting for me because I think it embraces the food, water, energy, waste nexus, the relationship between these systems. 
more than any other thing you can do in the city. Um, so, you know, you can learn something from solar panels, you can learn something from rainwater harvesting, you learn something from biodigesters, electric vehicles, all these things can help us go more towards being sustainable, but urban agriculture embraces this nexus in a way that's unique. So when we have people like Urban Harvest or Omega Bars or, Mush or, or, or Champagne de Brusle or Alexander integrating these systems into the built environment, we're actually unlocking a lot of knowledge that makes them really valuable sustainability professionals, that creates data and examples for how we can develop cities more effectively, that creates new education and inspiration for our youth. So I think that's a big part of the value, and, and that's why people and cities should invest in it um, either way, even beyond the, the products that are grown from it, which we know may be, be lower in yield um, relative to the scaled farms, let's say. So I think that in Belgium, you know, a lot of it is going to be about that leadership, and I think also it's a, it's a way to maintain the excitement in agriculture that exists by bringing it into the city as well. So I think it's a little bit of the kind of architectural approach, the social impacts, and the circular economy potential. Um, from exploring urban agriculture, that's the reason. The distance probably doesn't make a very big difference and isn't the biggest um, disruptor in, 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 in Belgium. I agree with you. Any last questions before we wrap up? Well, I really wanna thank all of you for your great questions and your time. It was a real pleasure to speak with you today. If you have further questions about Born Born membership, about the discount to Agritecture's farm planning software or its classes, you get $50 off if you're a member or becoming a member, please contact Nelle, her email is there. If you wanna to talk to Jeffrey or I, please contact us. Um, coming shortly, probably later tomorrow, you're gonna to get a video recording of this webinar and um, we really certainly hope to keep in touch with you. If you ever come to, the, come to New York City, for example, in the future, please let us know. We'd love to meet you. And that's how we actually met Nele first. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.